God, you are worthy of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Yeah. Thank you, Father. You are amazing, Father God. There's none, there's none compares to you. You are the creator of all things. The heaven and earth, Lord God, the universes are yours. Father, we thank you, God, that you are majesty on high. Thank you, Father. You are majesty on high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory. Glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. God, you're amazing. <laughs> you are amazing, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Ah, yes, Lord, we give you praise today. Blessing and honor and praise to your name. Father. Thank you, Father. Glory. Amazing God. You are amazing God. <laughs> there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of
seated this morning I could get back into my worship leader days real fast <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I was a worship leader until I started uh, they come to me one day and said you need to preach I said I never said I was called to preach this is when I was about 19 years old and uh they said, well, you don't have to. You get up and sing one song, preach for 20 minutes, so you might as well just start preaching. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Uh, Lord, we just speak to all those that are watching online right now, Lord God, that strength is filling them. Lord, I thank you for Doug and Val that are being raised up and healed at this very moment. Lord, there's too many names to mention. But, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we are receiving from you in Jesus name <laughs> hallelujah we are receiving from you in Jesus name thank you Lord awesome see you here today praise God amen if you're if you're here and healthy you should be just rejoicing in the Lord and just praising him amen there's been way too many sick way too many being taken out of this life we have victory in Jesus name amen hallelujah I've, I've often said that I'm gonna live till I die a lot of people don't understand that statement but a lot of people don't live they just exist they don't live life you know there's uh, there's so many people right now that are just existing and, and they're they're in fear you know of what all the things that might happen and and uh, are going on and and uh, you just you just gotta you can't let your life be arrested by things like that especially fear fear is a is a uh, torment uh, fear has torments God's not given us a spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind Amen. If, if you're afraid of something, set yourself to conquer it. Amen. Boy, that went over, that went over hard. <laughs> the, the common knowledge is if you're afraid of something, run from it. I was putting our grandkids to bed. Me and Sister Betty was putting our grandkids to bed here a while back, and it been a little over a year ago, and got ready to go to bed. We was tucking them in, and, and, uh, uh, my oldest grandson, he he didn't want to sleep next to a window. He said, "I don't I, I don't want to sleep next to a window. You know, they could get me. You know, where he got that, I don't know." Um, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" I said, uh, "We're Snyders. We're not controlled by fear." And uh, my little four or five year old granddaughter at that time, the middle one, she was sitting over on her bed listening. She spoke up and she said. I'm a Snyder, and I'm not controlled by fear. <laughs> I said, that's right, sweetie, you, you tell them. <laughs> oh, I like that. Amen. 
Amen. I'm gonna, we're going go to go to John chapter 15. We've just been using this as a springboard for quite a while now. And the more, the more I, I read this, the, the more I think, you know, God's got us here for a reason. All of, all of Christianity needs to be dwelling in, these, in uh, John 14 through 17 right now because it's his presence. It's, it's a relationship. It's, it's knowing who you're connected to is so important right now. And if you don't know that you're connected, if you don't know who you're connected to, then you're out here just, just uh, you know, just flapping in the wind. And uh, you don't have control. You know, I watched a guy, I was, I was uh, working on a, the end of a dock down on the lake the other day, and uh, all of a sudden, this, uh, I was right out on the end, about 20 feet in the air, fixing a light, and all of a sudden, this ferocious wind just come, I mean, just hard. And I, I literally had to, had to hold on to the frame for a little bit until it calmed down. It was trying to blow me off the ladder and all that kind of stuff. And um, I heard something flopping, you know, like sheets blowing in the wind behind me. And I turned around and looked, and there was a sailboat leaving the marina and going out. And his, his sails were just, you know, they were just, I mean, the wind was ferocious. And he was trying to get it turned in the wind, and all of a sudden that thing just laid over like that. And he was scrambling around. It was quite a show. He was, he was scrambling around there, and I, I was watching for a little while. And uh, he, he was trying to get it to where he could maneuver into the wind. And it was the best he could do is get it at a, like a 45-degree angle out there. And he was struggling. And, so, and all of a sudden, them sails dropped. And I heard a motor start up, and here he come right back <laughs> into the marina. His, <laughs> his selling day was over. Because he, he, he couldn't control the wind. And a lot of times we get out there and we don't feel like we have control of the things that are coming at us and hitting us. And uh, we just get to flopping in the wind like that. I mean, it sometimes it just lays us down. But I got to tell you something. God is greater than that. He's greater than the storms. He's greater than the wind. And he will get you back up. Amen. He will get you back up. He'll be that motor that starts up and gets you back in the marina. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I, la I had way too much fun watching that, but <laughs> praise God. John chapter 15, verse 7. We've talked about this different time. I want to talk about a word. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, now, that's not talking about just having something memorized. That's talking about it abiding, being at home, living, belonging in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, the, the word that, it, that has really I've been looking at and the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about is that word desire. You ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. Another place in Mark, Jesus said, whatsoever things you ask for when you pray, and another word for that is that ask is desire, whatever you, you, you desire, you feel affection toward, and that's what desire is. It's when you feel affection towards something. You desire that, and we battle, <coughs> we battle desires all the time in our life, different types of, de of desires. Every addiction and every problem that comes in our life is usually an inability to control a desire. Amen. An affection, a lust, whatever, whatever aspect you categorize that in. And most of our problems come from our inabilities to control or keep in check or set boundaries for desires. And we as, as Christians, we are, we, we, we are affectionate people just simply because we serve an affectionate God. We, we are emotional people because we have an emotional God. You know, God is not this pious, unemotional. He has not had Botox in his face. He has expressions. 
You know, I, I, I see people that's done that. You know, I was watching a lawyer talk on TV the other day, and, and I thought, man, she had her face is probably completely numb because her mouth moved, but the rest of her face did not move. I mean, there was no wrinkles. It was just, it was just this solid, you know. And I thought she is probably numb. Her whole face is numb. She's she's had all them nerves anyway. That's a side story. <laughs> but God is an emotional God. He laughs. He gets angry. He has love. His number one characteristic is love. Love is an affection. And so we don't serve an unaffectionate God. But we serve a God that declares that we have to learn to master our desires and our emotions, especially as people on this earth. What was it got us in trouble in the first place? It was Adam and Eve not being able to control or keep in check the desires that they had. The, the, devil, the devil did not trick them by getting them to lie or steal or cheat. The devil tricked them by getting them to desire to be better. That went over hard. <laughs> we live we live in a in a we live in a society today that's always trying to improve ourselves, aren't we? You know, the the the, the number one best sellers of Christian books are those uh, that that tell you how to live your best life, or five steps to freedom, and seven steps to prosperity, and and you can be you know you can be this way, you can be that way, and and we're always trying to improve ourselves. And I don't have anything against that, except for the fact that once you begin to focus on yourself, then you begin to fail at improving yourself. Amen. I've, I've often said that a person that becomes consumed with themselves will always consume themselves. Stop and think about that. You know, especially, you know, I am talking about plastic surgery and all that kind of stuff a while ago. Some, sometimes people get so consumed with themselves and changing themselves and trying to improve themselves that they actually destroy themselves. You know, Michael Jackson had such a desire for this perfect nose that he ended up with no nose at all. He ruined his nose. I mean, they, they, he had to wear a prosthetic nose because he was so, had such a desire for this certain look that he ended up ruining himself, you know, in, in a lot of ways, but just his nose. And so when we start focusing on ourselves, it's really hard to improve because once you started focusing on yourself, faults is what you find. Inabilities is what you find. The more you try to improve yourself, the more you realize that I need improvement. And so it becomes this perfectionist thing that will just really uh, cause you to be traumatized. It'll cause you to be, you know, um, a lot of times when, when people have uh, um, functioned in contests where it's, whether it's women and beauty contests or whatever, they usually merge from that with some emotional problems. And that is the fact that they never feel like they're good enough. They can never reach that mark. They usually end up some, with some kind of dysmorphia, whether it's body dysmorphia or, or whatever it might be. They, they end up with some type of, of dysmorphia where they, they can't see themselves for what they really are. They, they, in their brain, begins to see an image that they need to conform to that image, but they can never get to that image. Understand what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking against taking care of yourself and all that kind of stuff. We need to do that. Amen. If, 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 you're, if you're hitting a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts in the morning, then you need to check a desire. <laughs> Amen. And some of y'all saying, that's right, that's right, but you just pour that ketchup all over them french fries. There's, a, there's, there's as much sugar in three tablespoons of, of ketchup as there is in one Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> Woo, glory. I felt that one. Yeah, come on, preacher. Get, get back on the word. 
they, we, need to, we need to take care of ourselves and stay healthy, but when, when we stop looking at Jesus and we stop looking at Christ in me and we start looking at me trying to be like Christ, you have just taken on a task that you'll never be able to do. It's Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's what he can produce in you. Amen. Praise God. All right, desire. We, we, we need to look at the des desires, and then I'm going to talk about boundaries. I had this backwards in my notes, and I switched it around, and, and uh, we'll probably switch it back again. But in, uh, in Psalms chapter 27, look in the book of Psalms with me right now, chapter 27. David is just feeling just amazing faith and love for God and in the psalm and and he's singing to the Lord and about how he has confidence in God and and he's going to help him in all of his foes when his foes come to consume him and eat him but God's there and and in verse 4 it says one thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. What a desire. See, David's feeling really good about God, and he's, he's, he's absolutely locked in to purpose. He's locked into the presence of God. He is, he is totally focused on how amazing and awesome God is. And so he says, one thing... I have desired of the Lord. Isn't it amazing when you're in church and, or you're in prayer and you, you feel the presence of God and, and all of a sudden you just you, you sing songs like we sung today, I surrender all, you know? And, and uh, you know, I used to sing that song just to be funny, uh, I surrender all but that. I surrender all but that. <laughs> <laughs> Because we all have this desire to surrender to God when we're in the presence of God. But it's when you're away from that type of influence that we, we find out just how strong those desires are. David said, one thing have I desired of you, Lord. But yet in 2 Samuel, we find out that David had some other desires. 2 Samuel, chapter 11. One thing about the Bible, it tells our good sides and our bad sides. It says, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now, at that point, is when David should have said, Lord, one thing I have desired of you. But instead, he sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to her and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Desire is always either our blessing or our devouring. All of us deal with desire. Whatever type of desire it might be, David was in the presence of the Lord. He was in the temple and he was singing, God, one thing have I desired of you. I desire your presence, O oh God. I desire to be in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. But then one night he got up in the middle of the night, walked outside, and for whatever reason, Bathsheba was bathing on the top of her house. His house was up above hers. And he could see her. And instead of turning and saying, that's not who I am, he followed after his desires, and it cost him greatly. You see, the, you see the power of desire. It can go either way. And desire or affection in our life is, is uh, either a blessing or a curse. Affection that is not kept in check 
will always become excessive. Amen. Praise God. Now, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good here. It's good stuff. A desire that is not kept in check will always become obsessive. And everybody has different things that they obsess about. It might be clothes. It might be food. It might be money. It might be sexual desires. Whatever those desires are, if they're not brought to God and kept in check, then they will become our undoing and we'll end up, we'll end up spending, charging fifty to $80,000 in credit cards that'll never be paid off. Oh, I could have went all day without saying that, couldn't I? <laughs> We, uh, we, are a, we are a nation that is obsessed with being able to charge something, being able to buy something on credit. And it's easy to purchase. You can buy now, pay later. But when you do that, you're betting and gambling on tomorrow. And we have found out this year that tomorrow can be very unpredictable. Isn't that true? Amen. Last time I was in India, in India, I thought to myself, oh, no, because they have just now got the concept of loans. They didn't have the ability to get loans before from banks and stuff like that. It depended on what class you was in. Now, if you're in the upper class, the, then you could. But now they have figured out how to extend loans to the lower class people, the lower caste people. And so they're beginning to use that. And I rode in a vehicle. Then I was amazed. They come to pick me up in this brand new Toyota van that have, had every option you can imagine. And I'm looking at this thinking, where did this come from? And so we get in and we were heading out. We had to travel about three hours to uh, preach the gospel somewhere. And of course, I was thankful to be able to ride in a nice van. But the whole time I'm thinking, I know these people. Where did they get this van? And finally, one of them, one of them spoke up and said, we, we now have the ability to get loans. I said, really? They said, yeah, this, this van costs $30,000, but we only have to pay so much a month. Like it was some kind of new concept. And my heart just sinking. I'm thinking, yeah, that's true. But tomorrow there might not be that payment. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Man, it's getting tight in here. We're just, whoa. <laughs> Come on, we're going to break some chains today. But it could be finances. It can be whatever you look at and you desire. Always back up and give us some time before you purchase because desires should never be the reason that you purchase something. Amen. Come on, boy, it's pre I'm preaching good now. Yeah, it's, it's getting hot and heavy in here. But David, David, he, he, this desire rose up. Matter, matter of fact, we look in David's life, and David, David had this unchecked desire in his life. I mean, he already had two wives, and here he's looking at Bathsheba. You understand what I'm talking about? A desire that has gone crazy, a desire that's gone out, out, out of control, and, and, he had, didn't have the boundaries in his life to stop this destruction. If you got the boundaries in your life, then the destruction will be stopped. It'll be stayed. If you say, this is where I live. There's, there's two statements that I've found to be powerful in my life. Number one, when, when discouragement and problems and, and things hit, hit my life and when, when situations happen that are just, just tempt you to just be so discouraged and down and, and, and de feel defeated, I have a statement that I found is very powerful because what you say to yourself determines where you go. And I found that if I'll just stop and say, no, I am not going there. I'm not going down the road of discouragement. 
I'm not going down the road of disappointment. I might have the right to do so. I might, I might feel like this is my right, and I've been done wrong, and everything's went bad. But if I go down that road, I will end up damaging my life more than the original disappointment or discouragement has damaged my life. So I've, I've learned to say, you know, I'm not going there. It's just not going to happen. And I have to tell myself that continually. And then the second statement is this. That's just not who I am. Everybody say it with me. That's just not who I am. Come on. I didn't hear that last part, who I am. That is not who I am. Amen. Who are you? If you don't know, you're not going to be able to make that statement. Amen. That is not who I am. All of us, all of us are set up in situations like David and Bathsheba, and it might, it might be a desire. It might be sexual desire. It might be finances. It might be all kinds of stuff, but you have to know who you are. Amen. You have to know who you are. I know that there's a lot of traps that are set for us. There's, there's, there's a... Uh, a lot of situations that we get into that we have to quickly determine what are my values what are my core values because my core values is what's going to lead me in this situation if I don't have core values established in my life, then I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to, be able to do well in this situation, but I have core values established in my life that, that have already predetermined what my actions are going to be Amen. So when you have those core values, temptation, the answer to temptation has already been predetermined in your life. And so it's not going to take you over. You're not going to fall to that. There's always opportunities. There's always things laying before you. The sin is laying at the door. And anytime you want to open that door, you can. It's right there. Yeah, this was going to be a really awesome light message, and it is getting so heavy, so fast. <laughs> yeah. and, as, and if that's where it's going to be, that's where we're going. We are going there. <laughs> well, the same place where I work, I have to deal with this on a, on a continual basis, and all of us do. You know, there's, there, are, there are Potiphar's wives out there, and, and there are David's out there. And we have to determine what our value system is. And we have to say, this, what am I going to be? What am I going to do? I was working on a slip the other day, and uh, I do electrical work on the marinas. And, and so, I'm, especially in the summertime, I'm around people that are having fun, swimming and all this kind of stuff. And they're, they swim off the docks, but they're, which they're not supposed to, but they do. You know, we don't always do what we're supposed to do. And I've, after several years, I finally got tired of just being the bad guy and telling them they couldn't swim in the water. And I just, you know, it says right there on the dock, don't swim in the water. If you get hurt, you know, there's a sign. Because for years, I would go to them and say, guys, look, you can't swim off these docks. There's a chance of electrical, uh, electrocution. You know, you could get hurt. You know, you got to find a place to swim. You can't swim. And I, I did that for years, but anymore, I, I just think, oh, well, you know, you, you can't control everybody. And uh, because you never know. I was walking, I was working on a dock the other day and just walking down the middle. And I, I just happened to glance over and on this huge yacht, over $2 million boat, one of the leads, I just happened to notice that one of the big uh, electrical leads was not plugged in the back of the boat. There was two of them, and one of them was missing. And so I stopped what I was doing, walked over there, and when I walked over there, I looked down, and exactly what I figured, it had come loose, and there that lead was hanging in the water, feeding 240 volts of electricity in the water, backed up by, by 50 amps per lead, hanging in the water. And water is not a ground, it's a, condu it's a conductor. It's a really good conductor. So the problem with that is, if you get in the water, 
and you go and touch that, that dock and you're close to it, you suddenly become part of the circuit because the dock is grounded. And so once that happens, your hands, once you touch that dock, your hands grab hold of that metal and you cannot let go. No matter what you do, you can't let go. And so you just sit there with voltage running through your body until your heart stops beating. That was just a public announcement service for if you're swimming around a dock, okay? It doesn't matter how much, how much safety we put in building the systems, there's always things that go wrong. Sometimes boats have problems that happen inside the electrical system in a boat, and they start feeding voltage out the prop. So if you're in the water and you swim behind that prop, all of a sudden you're in the current and you feel it. <laughs> Can't you see why I try to tell people, hey, and so anymore I'll walk over to them and say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be in the water, but listen to me. When you go to get out of the, out of the water, please touch the dock with the back of your hand. Just, just touch it with the back of your hand before you grab hold of anything, and that way you'll know that it's safe. Because if you touch the dock with the back of your hand, you'll get shocked if there's a problem, but it won't grab you. But if you touch it like this, you're going to grab hold of it, and nothing's going to be able to get you off of that, okay? Y'all needed to know that. <laughs> so I was, working, I was working on this slip, and, and um, which, you know, this is just stuff that goes on. And so I was working, doing, I was installing uh, electrical service in this slip, changing it all out. And these ladies come out in their bathing suits and they said, we're going to get in the water for a while. I'm working. I said, okay. Sign. I'm not going to try to educate you here. Have a good day. And so I thought, Okay. And, uh, you know, they said, what's your name? I said, Tim Snyder. I'm the electrician here. I work, I've been working here a long time. Just kept working. And so they went and got in the water. And pretty soon I hear one of them say, hey, Tim, why don't you take a break and get in the water with us? <laughs> you ever feel like t taking that coat off? Now, in a situation like that, you have to have predetermined responses, okay? And my response was, not going to happen. I've got work to do. And so finally, one of them got out of the water and come up there where I was at and said, it's so hot, you really need to take a break and just, just get in the water with us and, and swim. And I said, I said ma'am, you can do whatever you want but I've got work to do, and when I get done here, i got more work to do. And so, uh, you know, just do whatever you want. You see what I'm talking about? We have to have predetermined values. I did not really intend to go here, but I'm going here. If we don't have predetermined values, then when a temptation of whatever kind is presented to us, then we have to stop and try to assess what my response is going to be. Now, if I have desires in my life that boundaries have not been set for, then I'm going to have a problem in that moment trying to make up my mind of what I'm going to do. Am I going to make that purchase? Am I going to give in to this temptation? Am I going to eat that cake? <laughs> what am I going to do? Do I have enough value established in my life to already have a response in my heart? Okay? If you don't, 
then you're going to leave it up to a momentary decision based on desire and compulsion that might get you in, in trouble if you have not prepared yourself for that by getting the values of God established in your heart. You know that we've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit, the works of the flesh. Talk about the power of desire. Okay? The power of desire. We have got a major, major problem in this country when it comes to desires. What we desire is what we're going to do. Amen. I was talking, brother, brother Mike was talking about being at work in the, in the candy store yesterday in a pouring rain, and, and they, they sold over $3,500 worth of candy in a pouring rain. What you want, you will go after if you want it. Amen. But I'm sure there's people got up this morning and saw some drizzle on their windshield and said, well, it's just, it's just a cold, rainy morning. I'm not going to go to church today. But I will trudge through water and raindrops as big as quarters to get some candy. <laughs> what we want is what we go for. If you want it bad enough, you'll figure out a way to get it. Amen. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> Woo. Times like this, I wish I could preach like T.D. Jakes. <laughs> he could be telling you that you are a failure, and you'd be shouting and saying, yeah. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. So we see, we see the battle in David's heart. He has this extreme desire to be in the presence of God. But when he's not in that atmosphere, he doesn't have the check and balance in his heart to turn down desires. See, if you, if you wait until you get to church or get in some atmosphere to desire the things of God, you're going to be in trouble. You need to desire the things of the Lord all the time. Amen. One thing I have desired is what our, our statement should be, that I would dwell in the presence of the Lord at work, at night, in my home, all the time, that I have this value system established in my heart that guards me and directs me and keeps me. Amen. You just got to decide what you're going to do. Amen. Amen. A good salesman knows how to prick into those desires. Amen. If you're a salesman here, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. But there's always going to be things presented to you that you're going to have to deal with. I knocked on a, a houseboat one day. I don't know why I'm telling these stories. I knocked on a houseboat one day door to let them know I was going down telling them all that I was going to have to shut the power off on the whole dock because we was going to have to uh, do some change on the main feed lines. And I was going down through there knocking on doors, and I knocked on this one houseboat, and the young lady opened the door with nothing on. It just... And she answered the door. She said, yes. And I said, we're going to be turning the power off, so I just want to let you know. And I turned around and walked off. And it's like, what was that all about? <laughs> Did she just all of a sudden think, oh, I don't I forgot that I didn't have anything on. No. People have certain desires that drive them, you got to decide whether that's going to be driving you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 I never tell these stories. I don't know why I'm telling them today. <laughs> I mean, it's just everyday life. I've been doing it for, almost, for 18 years, and it's just everyday life. But you got to have, you got to learn what it is. If you have a desire to to manipulate, if you have the desires to manipulate, you're going you're gonna to manipulate people, and, and it's going to get you in a lot of trouble. It's going to cause relationship problems. you gotta want, You got to ask yourself, what is it I really want in my life? What kind of person do I want to be? 
Because outside influence will only go so far to help you. The real stability has to come from within you. Amen. Wow. Let's, let's talk about some boundaries. In, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 22 and 23, why, why does God set boundaries? Is it because he just wants to punish us? Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, it says, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel of the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning. Now, why God was setting a boundary. Why was he setting a boundary? For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house, houses to strike you. Now, God was sitting a boundary, and the reason he was sitting a boundary, because he was wanting to protect people from what was about to happen. Okay? Now, they could have said, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. Come on, somebody. And they could have went outside. They could, they could have rebelled, but they would have suffered the consequences. God does not set boundaries. The Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, chapters 27 and 28, there's a whole lot of thou shalt nots. You know what that is? It is not God saying, I don't want you to enjoy life. It's God saying, I want you to understand what destroys life and what gives life, and I'm trying to set some boundaries for you so that you can stay out of this destroyer mentality. Today we have people saying, you can't tell me what to do. I, I put a post on Facebook yesterday about don't judge me. That is the number one statement. People that don't know any other verse in the Bible, they know that one. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. I hear that all the time. Well, you, you shouldn't judge me. To judge somebody, according to the way the Bible says it, is to criticize somebody without allowing them the opportunity of change. In other words, you are sentencing them and saying, this is who you are, this is who you always be, and you'll never be any better. Yeah. Amen. But there are activities that it doesn't matter who you are, you should not participate in. And if you participate in them, somebody needs to say you shouldn't be participating in that. And in the society we live in today, the first response is, you're not supposed to judge me. I ain't trying to judge you. I'm trying to help you to keep from falling off that pit into that flaming fire. Amen. 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 But people get offended today if you try to give them advice. I've never seen a time where people can't even be trained for a job. <laughs> it's like, don't tell me what to do. Well, what do you think you're doing here? <laughs> we have procedures that we go by. You can't just nilly-willy freelance this. And you don't own this company. So you, uh, you need to do what we are asking you to do. And there are people that will absolutely quit their job because they don't like being told what to do. I, I've never seen a time where somebody works on a job for three weeks and they want to be a manager. Why? Not because they want the responsibility, they want the income. But then they get mad when they have responsibility put on their shoulders. What? I'm not going to do that. You're asking too much. Man, this is good, this is good stuff. It really is. <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd say, you know, put your hand. I, I, have, I have tried to instruct people that have come to me for instruction. I mean, come to me and ask me for help. And when I start telling them what it's going to take 
to change their lives, they start arguing with me <laughs> and debating with me. It's like, okay, you obviously have the PhD in screwing your life up. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> I've been doing I've been doing behavioral and relational counseling for years. And there's times that I get like that that drill sergeant on TV that's trying to pose as a counselor. <laughs> you know what makes me angry? You make me angry. <laughs> Let's run you off to Mamby Pamby land and get you some self confidence. <laughs> I know the rest of you aren't like that. <laughs> but we, we reject boundaries. We reject things. We reject being told that you've got to drive in this lane. There are a lot of people that don't know that the left-hand lane is the passing lane. Got the crew sit on 55, <laughs> running right alongside the other traffic in the passing lane for miles. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> what are they saying? I'll drive wherever I want to drive. Yeah. Amen. And then all of a sudden, somebody not paying attention, looking at the phone, driving 75 mile an hour, all of a sudden hit them right in the back. And they don't, they get upset because somebody hit them. Well, some of them, man, the opinion just went crazy in this room. I mean, that, wow, I would not want to take that one to court. <laughs> boundaries. Why does God set boundaries? Jesus said, or in John chapter 15, where we was reading, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Why did he say that? Why did he say, and my words abide in you? Because when his words abide in you, they establish preset answers and boundaries. The word abides in you so that when, when something comes up, immediately that boundary, safety, comes up in front of you and you have a predetermined response to what you're going to do and what you're going to say. Amen. Everybody say with me, predetermined response. We can't just fly by the seat of our pants when it comes to morals and things like that because we'll crash land. We'll get in trouble. Amen. It'll change our lives and it, and it won't be good. Amen. So we have to establish these boundaries. And, these, you know, in, in relationship, there always has to be boundaries. If you want to have a long-lasting relationship with anybody— you have to have these boundaries that, that you keep in your life. Even in marriage. Now, in marriage, I mean, there's not a whole lot of boundaries. We, we get very familiar with each other in everything. But you still have to have boundaries in your life, even in marriage. And those boundaries are what I'm going to permit myself to say. How I'm going to permit myself to act. You still have to have boundaries. You know, me and Sister Betty, we've been married 42 years, and we established a boundary in our life at the very beginning, and that is we never say anything derogatory or critical about each other in front of other people. Not even in a joking manner. We don't joke in passive-aggressive statements. Man, I am dealing with some stuff today. <laughs> We're just going to go out behind the woodshed and get this over with right now. We established 
those values in our life at a very early age, especially with our children. We never confronted each other or corrected each other in front of our children. If one of us felt like the other one was saying something wrong, and it was usually me being too aggressive because I was always very aggressive and very dominant and, and, and uh, you know, whatever, you know, you do it and all this kind of stuff. I know, honey, I'm going a long time. Whenever you correct each other in front of your children, you have just showed your children that they have the right to do the same thing. And then you get all shook up when your child back talks you. Where did you get this? They learned it. Mm -hmm. They learned it. Your grandchildren, some of y'all my age, your grandchildren, you need to teach the same thing. You got to keep those boundaries. How you behave and how you treat each other and even in, even in private. Sister Betty, a lot of times, she would not agree with me about the way that I spoke to our kids because a lot of times I'd be very demanding or harsh. And afterwards, she would catch me by myself and she'd say, you really need to apologize because you was way too harsh. Which she was very smart because she a lot of times allowed me a few minutes to cool down before she said that. <laughs> because every time she'd say that, I would get hot all over you. <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. They don't start minding me. <laughs> uh, come on, somebody. Lighten up. Good night. Some of y'all's acting way too guilty. <laughs> but... When you, your behavior and the boundaries you set in your life will determine the, the kind of life you'll live. And it's not up to somebody else to set those boundaries. It's up to you to set those boundaries. Amen. In relationships, I always maintain boundaries. I never allow myself to get too familiar with people, and that's because I want to protect them. I want my friendship to last a long time. Amen. And friendships that don't have boundaries never last a long time. As a pastor, I always get nervous when I see people that have gotten acquainted with each other and they start, they start stepping over boundaries that are safe. And I see it happening and I think we are heading for a crash. And sometimes I'm able to step into that and say, you know, you need to kind of back off there a little bit. You need to, you know, be more respectful or something like that. But a lot of times I'm not able to. And I know that we're heading for a crash. And I know that it won't be long that they're going to both couples are going to leave this church. Because they get mad at each other. One of them gets offended. Then the other one gets offended. And it just amazes me. One family will end up leaving the church over it. And you think the other fan would stay? No, they leave the church too because it happened here. So they can't stay here because, Pastor, you're supposed to be able to stop this stuff. Come on, somebody. Oh, man, I'm going to get back up here. <laughs> it's getting dangerous down here. What is it? It has to come from the inside of you, it has to be something you possess. Because if it's not something you possess, it's not going to be imparted to you. You have to receive it and you have to activate it in your own life. Man, I'm going to quit. Amen. Desire, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, Paul told us, desire spiritual gifts. Affectionately desire spiritual gifts. All right? We've got a lot of problems in this country that could be handled very well with just boundaries and expectations. Amen. Boundaries and expectations. Our society needs to learn to have expectations again. Come on, somebody. You know, don't put your expectations on me. Well, there's expectations that need to be put on us. Amen. 
when my kids and my grandkids, even my grandkids, you know, your grandkids kind of get your heart a little more than your kids did for some reason. I think it's because you're older and, uh, and you've been down that road and, and, uh, you know, they, they just, they, grand, grandkids just connect to grandparents. I mean, immediately, you don't even have to tell them to, they just, they just do that. And man, they can, they can really, they can really mess with your emotions and your affections and, and, uh, they, they know how to, they know how to get you. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> I'd never had I'd never had daughters, never had girls in my house. And the first little daughter, little granddaughter I had, she was about two and a half years old and and I got on to her about something. You know, she was doing something and I said, Hey, stop that. You know, because I, even my grandchildren, I expect behavior out of my grandchildren. I will not, I will not condone bad behavior even in my grandkids. I mean, I, I want them to be productive citizens. I want them to grow up good. And so I got on to her and I was sitting in a chair. She come running over to me, kissed my hand and turned around and ran off. I looked at my wife and I said, I, I don't understand. <laughs> what was that? How am I supposed to respond to that? And she was just sitting there smiling. And I said, I said, that, 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 that's weird. <laughs> you know, my boys, they'd always bow up at me. I'd get on to them. You know, and so we had to have it out. And and she ran over and, and kissed my hand. And so I had to decide whether I was going to be able to continue expecting proper behavior out of her. <laughs> Especially when they crawl up on your lap and get you on both sides of the, of the face and say, Papa, I love you. <laughs> it's like, yes, you can have a Lamborghini when you're 16, sure. <laughs> That's what you feel in your heart. Stand with me today if you would. Desire, spiritual gift, desire. I, I, I tried to compact a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. We could talk about desires for a long time, but we, we've got to learn. We've got to learn to establish boundaries and predetermined responses in our heart and in our life because you're not going to have the time when you're presented with this in real time, if you're not ready with a, with a response, you're not going to be able to respond. If, if, if you are presented with an, with an opportunity to cheat when it comes to money and things, if you don't have a predetermined response, you're going to do it. Amen. You're going to do it. Even in your taxes. You got to say, okay, who am I? What am I? And what am I going to be? See, this, this is very important for the church because going forward, it don't matter who you are, what you are, where you go to church at, it doesn't matter. It, what matters is the church is going to have to say, who are we? And what are we? Father, I thank you for this today. I thank you, God, for putting into our hearts, Lord God, the, the insight and understanding. And Father, when we preach messages like this, Lord God, we, we have to, it, it, it comes down to us relating to you in such a level, Lord, that we're able to adopt who you are inside of us. Because we can never measure up to these standards, but Lord, you can. And we have received you inside of our hearts, inside of our lives. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God, I give you praise for that. God, you are amazing. You are amazing, Father God. Hallelujah. You are amazing, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You know, as I preached this message, I knew, I began to sense that I, I was talking to people that were struggling with this stuff. We all do. 
But when it becomes compulsive is, is when it really becomes a problem. Compulsive behavior is, is really difficult to change. And all of us have different things that we're compulsive about. You know, it's, it's hard to change those things. You know, work, working in, in building construction and all that kind of stuff all my life, I, I'm very compulsive about lines. Lines. When I'm putting up conduit and things on docks, I mean, a lot of people are never going to look up because most people don't see above six to seven feet in a room. They never, most, most of you never see the ceiling, never see above head level. But it doesn't matter to me. If that conduit does not match the lines of the dock, I, I just simply can't live with it. You know, I, I have actually tore stuff down and redone it because I get down and look at it and think, you know, we, we can't do that. And if you let it, those kind of things can become dictatorial in your life. Compulsive behaviors can become dictatorial in your life. But you have to, you have to go to somebody that's much greater than you are. I had y'all, some of y'all know Troy Hill. He had a boat down, I didn't know he had a boat down at the marina and, and known him for a long time. And I was finishing a, a, a patio that I put in, a slip down there and, and I was, I, I was in a hurry. I'm trying to get it done. And when I, when I stapled the uh, protective bumper on the front of it, I was in way too much of a hurry and the staples were not spaced evenly and they were not lined up right. And I got up, and I saw, and, and I stepped back, and I, you know, because at the time I was saying, it's okay, I'm in a hurry, it's in, I'm in a hurry. But when I stepped back and looked at it, it's like, it, it was just eating at me. And I didn't think anybody else was on the dock. And I'm out there saying, it's okay. It's, I, nobody's going to see that. It's okay. Just leave it alone. <laughs> I was talking to myself like that. Just walk away. And I heard this voice behind me say, do you do this often? <laughs> and I turned around, there's Troy Hill standing there, you know, all six foot eight of him. And I just grinned and I said, I'm trying to talk myself into accepting what I just did. He looked at it and he said, looks good to me. I said, that's it. Thank you very much. It's your slip. You live with it. I'm walking away. But if, if I was to allow that, to start controlling my life. Then it would go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, and before long, it would become a torment. Amen. And I believe I'm talking to people today that have some torments in your life. And you need Christ in you to be the hope of glory in your life today because you do not need to be tormented by these things. You do not, do not be, need to be tormented by these desires by these things that are compulsive, these things that are demanding. That are going to wreck and ruin your life if God doesn't help you with it. I have, I have talked to young ladies that were skin and bones. And they look in the mirror, they see themselves as being fat. It's just morphia. It's like, that's torment. That's not, that's not just wanting to look. That's torment. That's obsessive torment. I have, I have been around men that constantly obsess about the fact that they don't have what somebody else has. And they can't seem to get there. And it's, it's this dysmorphia. It's, it causes them to be tormented. Father, I just pray right now, God, that you just put your finger on our lives. Put your finger on our hearts, Father. Break this power in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Break this power in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I'm not going to ask you what it is, but I really feel that we need to take a step today. There's, there are some people in this house that need to take a step today and step forward and say, that's not who I am, and I'm coming out of this thing. And I, again, I am not going to ask you anything about it. it. It might be that you eat too much candy or something. I don't know. 
But I want you to come, I want you to get out of your seat and be brave and come up here and we're going to join in prayer that God's going to help us with this situation. Whatever the situation might be in your life, can we do that today? Can we be brave and step out and say, you know, I've got something in my life that I see is a threat to my life. It is threatening me and I need Jesus to help to impart to me the ability and the boundaries and the predetermined responses. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Is anybody brave enough to come and join me here today? I'm just standing here saying I, I, I have to deal with this stuff all the time. Amen. I have to deal with it all the time. And we have to say, God, I need your help. God, I need your help.